This is the War Room Roundtable podcast, the show that takes you around the world to share interviews with some of the most successful and relevant businessmen and women on the planet, hear their stories, and get the most important business lessons they've learned on the road to success, and get exclusive advice on how to implement their successes into your life and business. The War Room Roundtable is brought to you by your hosts, Jason Miller, CEO of Strategic Advisor Board, and Philip Lanos, CEO of Own the Rhythm, and former podcast host for Entrepreneur and Inc. Magazine. So, welcome to the War Room. It is a pleasure to have you here, Ivy. How are you? I'm doing great. I'm, I'm glad to be here. It's really a pleasure. Yeah, man. You know, I want to set the stage for this before we hit the traditional opening question, because it's going to be interesting to hear someone talk about something that very few people understand, but everybody knows a lot about. Does that make sense? Uh, (laughs) So if anybody's been listening to like what's happening with Web3 and blockchain and Bitcoin and all that, you're in for a treat. According to what I have here in my notes, we're about to find out in the in the in the interim before we get there. Uh, one thing Jason and I always like to ask, sort of as a traditional hazing to to onboard on the show, is <laughs> if uh, if you yourself come from a family of entrepreneurs or business owners at all. No, I come from a family of. Uh, my dad was with the Associated Press for forty two years. And I kind of grew up in newsrooms and became a career journalist and started at the age of 16. Child labor laws wouldn't allow that now. (laughs) Um, And then I got uh, a job at uh, the second largest newspaper in Houston right out of college, stayed there 14 years, went into corporate communications, and um, most recently have written my fourth book. Wow. A career journalist uh, and uh, an investigative journalist and editor, reporter of... uh, really had some great background in that career. Well, a lot of that lends a lot of weight to the work you decided to end up doing. And again, before we get there, uh, is it is it safe to say that a, the, the, a large part of you being who you are today had to do with being able to work so early on in the game and learning how stories are made and what's going on with all that? No doubt about it. And I think the, the biggest difficulty these days with working from home is I never would have enjoyed the career success that I've had if I hadn't have been in the newsroom on a daily basis and learned from people who are a lot older, wiser, and more experienced than me. And I think that's a big detriment to today's generation. It may be easy to sit at home, and yes, you have Zoom, but um, there's really no, no substitution for being with somebody in the same room. And that's what I found out. And one of the reasons I went ahead and wrote the book that I did on finding Satoshi. Yeah, man. Um, there's some there's some interesting stories out there because uh, uh, and and I don't, I'm not sure how familiar uh, uh, everyone who's listening is with uh, Bitcoin and and its founder and its origin story. Um, and obviously, I'm not going to go too deep into because I'm not the expert here. You are. Uh, you've done really extensive work. What I do know is the most common thing that everybody hears when they finally look look at it for what it is mm-hmm. is. We don't know who the person really is. And, and it was almost by design. Who started Bitcoin? Because it, in a lot of ways, is a disruptor that is promising to uproot pretty much the very fabric of imperial capitalism, right? If you will, that's sort of the, the overtones. But uh, I want to turn over to you for a second and ask you, with well, a career in investigative journalism, I can see that, right? Is that kind of what drove you? You were looking for that story that really made a lot of sense? Or is it something more? Well, it's something more, actually, and it's a, it kind of turned out to be a kind of a backward approach. Um, I was running my own small PR firm on Madison Avenue in New York and had an employee with me. And um, we responded to, of all things, a blind ad on Upwork.com for freelancers. And, uh, you know, at first, um, I was a little oblivious to it all. I said, oh, this ad really can't be real. It didn't mention Satoshi Nakamoto, the creator of Bitcoin at all, but one thing led to another. And that's when my background in investigative journalism, I kept every day, I looked for a reason to say, well, this is a fraud. This is a hoax. I'm not going to get involved with this, but I could never do that. It never happened. And I didn't meet or actually communicate with the actual Satoshi Nakamoto for two months when I took a flight to Manchester, England, didn't know what he looked like. 
He knew what I looked like because I'm on LinkedIn. And for the next seven months, made three trips to England, had more than 100 communications with him in terms of meetings and conferences, um, and many texts, all of which I've kept. And it's very clear to me that, you know, uh, a native Pakistani who lives in the UK, uh, birth name was Bilal Khalid, but he's now known as James Khan. He changed his name for UK Depot. And even though nobody thinks they know who Satoshi Nakamoto is, uh, if they read the book, they will know because 100% of the book is provably true. Or I wouldn't have wasted my time doing it. And one of the reasons, and let me just add this quickly, that I think it's very difficult for anybody to believe it, okay? At one time, early on with Bitcoin, like 10, 12 years ago, people were extremely interested in who Satoshi is. Not that they aren't now, but what's replaced that now is everybody is interested in the money aspect. See, in 2015, Bitcoin, each Bitcoin was less than $1,000 a piece. But since then, you know, one time it reached almost 70000 The two things people really want to know about Bitcoin today are, how can I make money in it? And to a much lesser degree, how does the technology work? And the reality is, as I have in the book, nobody can predict what Bitcoin's going to do next year, next week, or even tomorrow. It's a fool's game. And um, people, if people really wanted to know who Satoshi was, all they have to do is read the book. I know there have been a lot of hoaxes. There have been a lot of uh, pretenders. You know, this is absolutely real. I mean, this is pretty big. Like, at least from, I've spent, I don't know, maybe the past three years talking to a lot of people who are founders in Web3 and all of them had said, when I asked the question, you know, who do you wish would be here? They said, well, while nobody knows who they are, I would hope to have Satoshi Nakamoto here. And I, there's a few people I, I can even send you to their shows to continue to talk about the work that you've done, because that's a pretty big deal, man. <laughs> well, and I always make it a point to under promise and over deliver. But this is something that I lived with. I haven't spoken with the man in over two years because, again, you have to read the book. But just like Satoshi Nakamoto did in late 2010, when times got challenging, he disappeared. And, um, you know, it shouldn't take any really work to find the guy again. You know, I, I know where he lives, but um, I purposely not communicated with him because I don't want anybody to think that this is a hoax or a ruse or right, you know, right. something that we're put together. Um, that's just simply not the case. A professional distance. I see that. Exactly. Yeah, no, exactly. I understand it. I understand and, it. And I'll even challenge anybody who listens to this podcast. If they read the book or go to my website, findingsatoshibook.com, and find anything at all that they can prove is not true, please contact me. It hadn't happened yet. <laughs> Nobody uh, would have found yeah. Satoshi Nakamoto if he hadn't have made the effort to be found. And of all the people in the universe, and I'll never know why, he came my way. And I think he was impressed with my truthfulness and accuracy and my background, not only in journalism, but I worked in the mutual fund field for many years. And um, I was so just going to ask, I was <laughs> just going to ask, what does your career look like in terms of writing or covering stories and finance? And now, now it makes a lot more sense. Yeah. Actually, you know, it's, it, I was in sports writing and sports editing before I got into corporate communications. Um, but there's really, there's a lot of crossover um, abilities between covering sports, believe it or not, and mutual funds. They both are concentrated on numbers. And um, the two aptitude tests I've taken in my life, 20 years apart, each time it drilled in on the very same career, tax lawyer. <laughs> so I guess I must know a little bit about numbers, but don't ask me about algebra. <laughs> yeah algebra is in real life man um but finances are that's 100 percent true so uh, payroll <laughs> <laughs> that's some real shit right there <laughs> that ain't you, fun either sometimes no. at the end of the month <laughs> yeah man i mean without giving the book away man i i'd love to know whether or not and i think i have a general sense based on what you said earlier but do you have a positive outlook on 
Bitcoin and where it's going, having researched it the way that you did, because I'm going to take a look at it myself. There's a few people, like I said, I want to put you in touch with, or it, uh, did after doing all that work, you, you found out it's, it's not as favorable as it once was. Well, I think that depends on how you would define the answer. You know, if you're going to define the answer of what will Bitcoin be worth in a year, five years, 10 years? Oh, no, I meant, yeah, I meant out, it more but, as an outlook on social. Oh, I work. think that, you know, even someone like SEC commissioner or chair Gary Gensler has said, you know, Bitcoin's the real thing. Now, whether it'll replace the Fed anytime soon, I can't say. And yes, certain countries are so afraid of it, like China, you know, they've outlawed it. Um, so there must be a reason there. If Bitcoin was a disaster, they wouldn't have done that. You know, the Chinese are not dumb. So, um, you know, where will Bitcoin be in 10 years as far as how well accepted it is? Well, hopefully it needs an ambassador now that it's really never had. And the pe person I've written about would be the ambassador. Matter of fact, on my website, there's a letter that was filed with the... Um, uh, with the Department of Justice in August of 2020, written by Satoshi Nakamoto, uh, interested in a um, meeting with the, um, the, the commodities group in, in um, Washington, D.C. And you can't submit that letter unless you have a lobbyist. And to have a lobbyist, you have to file a lot as a foreign agent. You have to file a lot of information with the DOJ, which was done. So if the DOJ thought this guy was a liar, they never would have accepted or they'd have looked into perjury charges. That hadn't happened and it won't because it's the truth. Wow, this is heavy. Um, and a perfect example of this, uh, ha have, you, have you purchased any Bitcoin or anything like that, Jason? Is that something that you're interested in at all? I, I, I purchased zero myself. <laughs> I don't have zero. any. I, I had, so back in when it first I remember, and, and I wish I still had it, but, but I remember way back when the internet started, <laughs> right? I remember I got this email and it was an email that says, you've been awarded two Bitcoins. And then you could, you'd print this certificate out and it had these numbers on it and all this stuff, right? For the life of me, when it was went up to like 70 grand, I was like digging through everything. I was like, where the hell are those at? <laughs> I'm sure they probably long got repurposed by now, but well, but, Bitcoin uh, is going to have a Bitcoin's going to have a tough tough future because if you look at just regular savings account versus the stock market and how many people are invested or won't invest in the stock market because you know they don't have the um, safety that a savings account, is. even yeah. though you know as low as interest rates have been, they've lost money in recent years by hoarding their money mm. or keeping it under the mattress. So if people have a fear for losing their money just by going into the stock market, you can imagine what their concern is by going into Bitcoin because it's been yeah. quite a roller coaster ride. And uh, I think you have to understand how to, to ride a roller coaster successfully in order to invest in Bitcoin. <laughs> no, Not I, to I, mention there's just all these other ones now. Yeah, right? there's it isn't a lot just of coins. Bitcoin. There's a <laughs> ton of different ones now. So it's like, you know, but that's what starts all well, skeptical about it too, right? It's because it's just well, like, oh, hey, here's the next whammy, whammy coin came out today. <laughs> <laughs> well, name me every cryptocurrency you can think of that started before Bitcoin. None. Uh, yeah. My yeah. only one I really know is Bitcoin. <laughs> so I think that there's um, imitation, you know, is, is flattery, right? Mm. And um, people have tried, and some have been somewhat successful. I'm not mocking them all, right. but there have been a lot more failures than successes. Yeah, no. I mean, it, the only one that I've seen really do anything outside of uh, what Bitcoin has done is Ethereum, and that's because it's more of a software, sort of smart contracts, things of that nature. So I get that. Um, and I just think it's really fascinating because you're right. People will hoard all their money in a savings account, and yeah, they're percentage that it earns is terrible. Whereas if you just went into an index fund, you'd at least make 10% because the market always breaks at least somewhere roughly around there, right? Annually. And yet most people wouldn't for the life of them throw any money in that direction. And those same people who wouldn't do that, especially the younger crowd. I mean, you saw what happened with GameStop. I, mean, I don't have to tell you. I mean, that's your field. You know what happened there with the retail investing. 
I mean, they'll throw as much money as they can in that direction for a quick buck, not realizing, you know, finance is a tricky game in, in, in a modern society. But the fact that we have someone on this show right now that has been able to look at all this over a number of years and more importantly, investigated one of the most hotly contested subjects of the last, I want to say, maybe even 10 years, like people were really mm-hmm. looking at it. That's fascinating and a privilege, I feel, to be able to have you on here. Is there anything that after you wrote the book, you realized, God, I wish I talked more about this? Great question. And I would say not really. Um, I spent a long time researching this. As a matter of fact, the book has over 350 end notes oh, or, wow. or footnotes. And so I was I knew that every word of the book would be parsed by <laughs> critics and cynics and so forth. And so I wanted to make sure that everything I wrote um, was researched. And I have a copy of every quote and, uh, that I have in the book from James Kahn because I kept them all from the work I did three years ago. Um, and I'll challenge anybody if they want to come and look through everything or try to debunk it, I'll roll out the red carpet because um, I'm a very objective and skeptical individual. I'm, I'm the original Doubting Thomas, but <laughs> every day I looked, I said, what is not adding up about this? And there's a couple of things in the book and on the website that I think really embellish that. I mean, it's um, some things that he said to me that are in the book. Um, let somebody tell me why he's not Satoshi Nakamura. Wow. Now, there's some other people who pretended to be him, and I'll mention one right now. You know, Craig Wright is probably the most um, popular or well-known Satoshi wannabe. He's a self-professed Satoshi Nakamoto. The week the book came out, Craig um, sent me a comment on my LinkedIn account about the book saying, calling me a con man and saying he was going to force bankruptcy on me and, and even press criminal charges. And I'm thinking, wow, that's the best publicity this book could ever have. (laughs) Um, And then I found out just a week or two ago that um, he took down the comment from my uh, LinkedIn site and subsequently deleted his own LinkedIn account. If you go to the About Us page on his company, Enchain, there are seven um, employees listed as part of the leadership team. He's one of the seven. He's the only one that doesn't have a LinkedIn account. Hmm. So tell me. The the only thing I could relate this to for those who don't seem to understand the magnitude of what we're talking about here is um, it's it's another hotly contested subject that we don't really know who Shakespeare was. And we believe that Shakespeare was really a straw man for people who were in the royal court. That's why everything was so illustrious and so detailed and like, how could they know these things? And then there's evidence of like Shakespeare himself was illiterate, couldn't even write his name. But there's a there's a movie called Anonymous that sort of tries to show their own take on what may have happened uh, with Ben Johnson, another poet of that time. And so I can only relate it to something on that level where years later, even though it's already currently within the niche of what is the blockchain cryptocurrency space on Web3, this is going to be that important. That's why when I read this, I was like, wait a minute. As I'm reading the notes, I'm thinking, I'm thinking out loud to myself, like, wait, what? Because <laughs> everybody, I mean, everybody I've spoken to from the Web3 space would be flipping right now out of their minds to know that this is out there. So for me, I, I can't wait to introduce you to certain people that I think are going to help magnify what you've done with this work, especially it being so extensive. And um, if anybody in the strategic advisor board community has had <laughs> investments and has been looking into this field, then you'll definitely be able to appreciate, as I'm speaking to you right now, how important the work that Ivy has done is, because it actually is. Like, what if I if what I'm listening to is true, and you're inviting all kinds of scrutiny because you you're prepared for this. <laughs> you bet. It is a big deal, man, and I'm really excited. I'm going to dig into it myself. Um, that being said. Uh, I'm wondering if you could go back to before you started this project. Sometimes people face an option in life where they can take advantage of an opportunity and do some work 
but then it doesn't seem like it's adding up or uh, they don't, they're not sure. They don't want to place the bet on that because this is what entrepreneurs do, right? They they get an opportunity presented to them and they have to weigh out whether or not they're going to invest in this direction because they can't do everything or not. So if you could go back yourself, what would you say to yourself to weigh the pros and cons about pursuing something that clearly took a lot of time, effort, energy, money, resources? Well, I think, you know, the, the pros has to be that you want to find the truth. Anything short of the truth is a waste of time, effort. Um, the cons are, well, it has to be provably true, right? And um, I'm a very, very, um, I don't want to say open and shut or cut and dried person. But again, I'm very skeptical. You have to be skeptical as a journalist. You know, that's why you ask questions of people for people who can't be there to ask questions themselves. And um, as I wrote to um, Satoshi and his proxy that I communicated with before uh, ever meeting Satoshi, I was very reluctant to take on their project to you know, uh, identify him and also help release a project that wasn't a pump and dump. It was to make Bitcoin better, okay? Because he saw a lot of problems with it since he had left. And um, I said, hey, my reputation is my biggest asset. I'm not about to get into something unless I can really make sure that this is true. And what really tipped the scale was that I said, look, I'll travel anywhere in the world at my expense if you can prove to me that you are who you are. And it took two or three weeks before we could get something set up. But I knew the very first day that this was the guy. And you're going to say, well, how could you know that soon? I said, maybe not 100%, but I was leaning in that direction. Keep in mind, it used to be the only way people thought that Satoshi could really be identified is to move a Bitcoin, okay? Because Satoshi Nakamoto has never moved any of the million Bitcoins he mined. Okay, if he was saving for a rainy day, I could see that. But you tell me who in the world who once had a Bitcoin stash of $69 billion wouldn't move one. It defies human nature. And that's because he lost them in a hard drive incident in 2010. That's one of the things that accelerated his departure from Bitcoin. Not only that, but he was engaged and was to be married in October of 2010, which he did get married at that time. And he waited until eight years into his marriage before he told his wife that he was Satoshi Nakamoto. And the funny thing is, she said, who's that? <laughs> oh, no. And I got the story backed up from her, just me and her. When I visited their home in Doncaster, England in um, September of September, early October of 2019, she even told me where she was sitting and where he was sitting when he said he was Satoshi. There are people out there who lost maybe three thousand dollars in a USB drive and lost their mind. He lost sixty nine billion. Oh, my God. <laughs> well, and that's one of the reasons that he you know, really kind of went into a trance and, and didn't do much with Bitcoin after that, because he was so ashamed that the creator of Bitcoin. And it's a long story of how it happened. But he even produced the two laptop computers circa 2009, 2010. And he actually offered them up. He usually offered very little to me. I had to ask the questions to probe. But we were all in, a, my two colleagues and I were in um, Manchester uh, one day in August of 2019. And he said, oh, well, you know, I can bring the two laptops from home. And I had plenty of photos. Who could that's do amazing. that 10 years later? But see, that's just one of many pieces of evidence. It's not just one or two things that's going to tip the scales. There's over 100 I'm really glad I learned about this and got a chance to talk to you. Uh, there's more to talk about as we close things out. There's a few pieces of business that we address. So sure. I've got a few questions in particular that I want to ask. But before we do that, given how awesome this is, I just want to be able to give a shout out to one of our uh, supporters who actually made this conversation possible at all. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and that is Rogue Publishing Partners. They, they, they offer a host of experts in the independent publishing industry, whether you're an executive, an entrepreneur, a coach, a consultant to help write and publish and market your books. And they've designed that this method that can help you get the traction you're looking for in the marketplace. So if that's speaking to you, just go ahead and go to roguepublishingpartners.com and let them know the war room sent you. Now, back to this conversation here. So we've addressed how you would have looked at things uh, prior. Mm -hmm. But I got to ask, are you writing on any other coins? 
or anything like that? Oh, like, no. Are you on the on the space at all? <laughs> to use a cliche, this is a one and done. And <laughs> the, the, there are three reasons that I really wanted to do the book. One, far and away, the most important is to get the truth out there. Uh, the world has gone far too long without knowing the real truth about who Satoshi Nakamoto is. The second reason is Satoshi Nakamoto is credited with one of the biggest inventions of our generation, right? Not only Bitcoin, but blockchain. Um, yeah. And he has been rewarded as little as anybody in history of anyone who made that level of a contribution. He's earned nothing. Okay. And, you know, the third thing is, I believe society would benefit a lot from his knowledge and expertise. You know, I'm not trying to say that he's the second coming, but certainly anybody who had the, you know, uh, genius and intelligence and commitment and perseverance to have created Bitcoin certainly must have some value to society today, even if it's nothing more than a college professor or a consultant. Yeah. Notice how it would benefit him. The only thing that will benefit me is the truth, and it's in the book. I mean, yeah, breaking a story like this is, a, I mean, given that he's one of the most important things to talk about in this generation, and you got the exclusive on that, man, that is epic. <laughs> well, that's, and, and that's, I, I realize, look, on the surface, let's turn it around. Let's say that someone told me the same story that I'm telling you. Given my um, skepticism, I would say, yeah, right, you know, uh, and the cow's going to jump over the moon on Labor Day, right? No, um, you might say that at first, but then when you start looking into the facts, there's no doubt whatsoever. Has this hit the mainstream, like, news media? A couple of people have written about it, but I'm going to go back to something I said earlier. Most of the Bitcoin sites, um, 90% of it is, how do I make money? Yeah. Money's right. the big carrot, right? Knowing who Satoshi is isn't going to make anybody any money. Maybe me a little bit, hopefully to cover <laughs> my costs. But, but um, no, I'm not doing this to become a millionaire. I have no ego. I just am intent on revealing the truth. For a journalist, that's definitely worth more yeah. than a couple dollars. <laughs> it's, well, just, it's interesting we'll that nobody's like wanted to pick this up from you and like really take off with it. Um, there was a podcast. It's, a, it's a pretty big deal. <laughs> well, there was a podcast that had me on about two or three weeks ago. And to their credit, I mean, they were great at asking questions. They handled everything objectively. They didn't treat me like I was a genius or an idiot, either one. <laughs> um, and, you know, they came to the conclusion on the air and they had no reason to do this. They said this was so thought provoking. It's, it's unbelievable. And a lady who's their um, head person in the office who, you know, schedules everything. She said this was one of the most interesting of the 600 plus podcasts with it. It definitely warrants that. I mean, I can only imagine you having to be able to be in a position where you have to verify the identity of someone like this, that means that you it would it would substantiate that you at the very least understand how how acquiring a wallet works in modern day, right? Um, whether or not they understand how to do that and why they think it's effective or not, they themselves having lost the hard drive, what that means, they were definitely around at a time when there wasn't digital wallets like there are today, mm -hmm. which is like, ouch. You know, because I, that's one of the reasons that I stayed out of it when I heard about it as early as I did. And so there's a lot of work and not for the layman stepping into the blockchain and, and, and crypto and in particular Bitcoin. Like it's not necessarily a walk in the park, but given the space that you're in, your understanding of financial vehicles in general, stepping over into this. I mean, I had a friend who went to the London School of Economics who I asked because I had met him through a co-working space and, you know, became good friends. And I told him, Hey, what do you think about this? I mean, you worked on wall street. What do you think? It's like, it's all speculation, man. You know, that's basically what he said to me. And to this day, he stands by that. doesn't feel bad about him missing any marks or anything, but I imagine there was a lot of work that went into trying to understand all of that 
to then be able to use that as a case study for verifying whether or not Satoshi existed. And is that what they grilled about? Is that what they grilled you about in the other show? No, they didn't at all, because in the book, in the introduction, I make it very clear what the value proposition of the book is. And two things it is not is how to invest in Bitcoin. Truthfully, I don't think anybody can tell you how to invest in Bitcoin. <laughs> um, you know, there have been a lot of predictions, not many of them accurate, right? And the other thing is, there have been many books that have been very well written on looking under the hood of Bitcoin or blockchain and how the technology works. That's way above my pay grade. I made it set up front in the introduction before the people got to the first chapter. If you're thinking this book is going to do this for you, you're mistaken, you know, go buy something else. But if you're interested in being privy to the most interesting identity mystery, gee, especially if someone who's not been labeled a criminal or a criminal suspect, right? The most interesting identity of, let's say, a non-criminal person, gee, I would say in the last 50 or 100 years anyway, yeah. this mystery is for you. It's very unusual. How many people, especially in, in the age of the internet, have been able to protect their identity, even if they wanted to, right? And he really, he really, really went to unbelievable lengths to do that. And a lot of it is in the book. And it's, it's more valuable than ever uh, because specifically he, this person presumably stood to gain so much from letting everybody know who he was. And yet he didn't do that. He did the opposite. And, for what reason? Well, I imagine reading your book, we'll find out why. <laughs> I, would, I would encourage people to go to um, chapter 15 and read the story about the one word that he hastily called me about when he only had called me like three times on the phone in seven months because he was so, you know, secretive and, you know, reclusive. He wanted me to edit one word in a newsletter, and it was one word that I mistakenly had added, and he wanted me to do so because we have to make sure we're truthful and accurate at all times. I, I can't make that up. Oh, man. Okay. Uh, well, with that said, I, I, I think uh, we've made it a uh, good time here. Is it time for the grand finale, Jason? You got it some is. thoughts? Oh, I'm sorry. Indeed, it is. You got all it. All right. Yeah. So the grand finale <laughs> is uh, if you could have invited anybody to this conversation today to sit in and listen in. Uh, who would you have loved to have had here, Ivy, and why them? Let me guess. <laughs> <laughs> well, let, let me put it myself here for a minute because, you know, I scheduled this, unfortunately, at the precisely wrong time for sunset here in my neighborhood, and I've got the blinds of all things drawn, and it still didn't help. So um, it's like kind of film noir, right? Um, <laughs> and so I'm going to say the person is Alfred Hitchcock. Hmm. And here's the guy who arguably directed more of the top 100 films of all time and yet never got an Academy Award as Best Director. Wow. And I would like to discuss with him why he said a great movie should be like a roller coaster ride. Because we all have to ride roller coasters in our life, you know, emotionally. And uh, he said uh, the reason a movie should be like a roller coaster is, you know, it kind of starts slowly and you know, then picks up speed a little bit. And then, you know, there's this apprehension as you, you know, get toward the climax. And then when you go down that steep incline, you're screaming and yelling and fear and, you know, all that. And then as soon as you get off the ride, you're laughing because you can't wait to do it again. He says, that's exactly what a movie should be. When you get out of that theater, you can't wait to see it again. Yeah, man. Um, that's, that's a good way for looking <laughs> at life, right? I mean, you've got to enjoy the ups, the downs. And I mean, I did not know he never won an award. That's insane. He's a legend. <laughs> oh, yeah. Draw your own conclusions. <laughs> <laughs> it's all taste. No, I mean, it's been an absolute pleasure and a very curious conversation to have with you. I'm going to take a look at the book. And like I said, there's some people I want to introduce you to. Um, but with that said, it's tradition around here for Jason. So it closes out. So I'll turn it over to him. Very enlightening conversation. I will say that. Um, for sure, I would have never, ever guessed having uh, you as a guest on this show, um, for sure. And gosh, thanks for coming and sharing it. That's really, really cool stuff. And uh, yeah, we, uh, I, you got me intrigued, so I'm going to buy the book now. So there you go. <laughs> thanks well, for thank being you. on the show. 
And let me say, I'm an admirer of your work too, Jason, and I salute you for everything you've done in your career. Well, thank you. All right. Well, cheers. cheers. Thanks for listening to the War Room Roundtable with your hosts, Jason Miller and Philip Lanos. Please leave your feedback and visit strategicadvisorboard.com to get the latest and greatest business advisement on the planet. Follow us on social media for updates. And always remember, if you can dream it and believe it, then you can go achieve it. We'll see you in the next episode.